Ooh. So these are genuine pre-World War II Bakelite cups and saucers. You'll notice, however, that I am not drinking out of these because these are as old as time itself. Hello and welcome back to Class 509, the corner of the internet where I sit down, drink tea and talk about science history. It's a pretty good time. Today we're going to keep going with our History of Plastic series. Now it's been a little while, so if you feel like you need to catch up, make sure you click the I button right there. We left Alexander Parks sad and very broke in the mid 1800s. And scientists and manufacturers could both clearly see that there were distinct advantages to plastic, but it still had a few problems. And the reason this revolution was so teeny tiny was basically down to two things. The first was money. You see, to make plastic, you needed to have money to own a massive manufacturing plant. And hurdle number two was resources. Like I've said a few times, all of these plastics that had previously been made to things like vulcanized rubber, parkesine, celluloid, all of that kind of stuff, had all been made using naturally occurring products. So manufacturers could see the benefits, but there weren't really an awful lot of incentives for them to actually get in and make stuff. And that is where this stuff comes in. And this stuff was invented by a guy called Leo Bakerland. Bakerland was born in Ghent in Belgium in a year that I have forgotten. In 1863. <laughs> he went on to study at university and studied chemistry and physics and became a chemistry teaching professor at the ripe old age of 24. A few years later, he was offered some sort of teaching fellowship -y research place thing in New York and so he and his wife packed up and moved to the US. Bakerland was a little bit of an inventor and super interested in photography and actually around about this time photography was becoming really popular. The scientists were constantly trying to figure out ways to improve the development process as well and Leo Bakerland decided to turn his attention to this particular problem, he ended up inventing a type of paper he called Velox. Bakerland ended up selling this particular product to Kodak for, get this, one million dollars. Which doesn't sound like an awful lot now, but I did the maths and in today's money that's 30 million dollars. So he was pretty loaded. A little bit loaded. But he wasn't done. Oh no. Seriously, if this were me, I would have like retired to a, my giant pile of money and like, no, nah, I'm done. I'm done. He ended up working on shellacs. Shellacs were a furniture coating, like varnish, that dried hard and they were made out of beetle shells. And he ended up figuring out a way to make that completely synthetically. He called it Novalac. But unfortunately, this one didn't take off so well. At this point, he's working on a bunch of delightful chemicals. Things like phenol, which is a super crazy irritant, and formaldehyde, which is that amazingly delightful chemical used in the preservation of things in museums and as a disinfectant. It also very exceedingly very definitely causes cancer. Yep, that's a thing. So he's working with some great things. After Novalac was a little bit of a flop, he then turned his attention to fixing another super delightful chemical, this time asbestos. I should also point out that he's doing all of these experiments in his home laboratory. Uh, this seems like a smart idea. Bakerland wanted to try and make asbestos better. He wanted to try and find a better way to make it useful and make it a useful building material. At that point it was quite brittle, so he wanted to find a way that would strengthen it. Chemistry is one of those fun things where things like temperature and pressure can have a huge effect on the outcomes of your experiments and your reactions. So Bakerland started playing around with the temperature and pressure of his reactions with asbestos until one day he was working on a bunch of solvents and preparing to combine them with asbestos. He ran his experiment and then kind of changed the temperature and pressure until he hit just the right point to create a plastic. This stuff. This is Bakelite. He kind of fished around for something to call it and went, oh you know what, I'm gonna name it after myself. I'm rich, I'm intelligent, I fully deserve it. That's totally how the world works, right? Yeah. This stuff was a revolution and a legitimate revolution. The thing is, this can be created out of really, really ridiculously cheap materials. I'm talking super duper cheap. And they could be dyed different colours as well, like the second they discovered that this particular material took colour relatively well, they ended up being used in things like buttons and furniture and stuff like this. 
There are a whole bunch of Bakelite telephones that you can find. It was literally everywhere in the early 1900s. Bakelite was used in literally everything it could possibly be used in until about the end of World War II when some new kids on the block kind of turned up and went, we can take colour better than you. Uh, and so people were like, yes, we'll use you in the place of Bakelite. Once again, I'm really getting like the vernacular of the time totally down. And I'm also giving inanimate objects voices now. Yeah, I think I'm actually losing my mind. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching another episode of Class 509 Science History. Make sure that you hit the subscribe button and also click the little bell next to it so you can get notifications about when videos go up. It's gonna be a little bit more sporadic over the next few weeks as I get my life sorted because that is a thing that I really need to do at some point. <laughs> You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Um, you can also find links on my Facebook page to the Flame Challenge. I'm a finalist this year. It's pretty fun. There was a worldwide assembly of about a week ago, and you can go and watch Alan Alder talk about my entry for the Flame Challenge. It's a bit strange, but it's really cool. And there are adorable children talking about it, so it's really fun. Adorable children with Irish accents. I mean, what more could you possibly want? Go and check it out. It's up on my Facebook page, so follow me for updates as well. Uh, things be cray. I should never use those words ever again. No, that's not.